This morning we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. And just a few verses of this particular chapter, I'd like to read for you verses 14 through 17, and that is going to be our, our text. 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 17. Peter writes this to um, his, uh, well, to those, uh, I believe, scattered throughout uh, various regions of the uh, Roman Empire uh, who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. May the Lord bless this portion of his word uh, to our hearing and again use it uh, to bless us this morning. Well, so far, as we've been going through our series, uh, John Knox, the first one we've looked at, reminded us that our Lord calls us to be uh, courageous, courageous for him, courageous for his cause. Fear, as you know, as well as I, is a very powerful enemy that we need to overcome. We never gain anything through fear. We always lose. It's, it's, again, an adversary that comes to try to take away what the Lord would want to do through us. I mean, just take a look back over your life and notice whether or not everything that was worthwhile that you've ever achieved by God's grace has come to you through having courage. That's the reason why the Lord calls us to be strong. Remember what he said to Joshua when he called him to take the armies of Israel into Palestine and to conquer the land. He says in Joshua 1 verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If Joshua were afraid, he would never have been able to accomplish what the Lord called him to do. He needed courage and so the Lord not only commands him, but he also, of course, reminds him that he would be with him. Really, all the things that, that the Lord gave to Joshua, he has also uh, given to us. Well, what the Lord says to Joshua, of course, he has also said to us, and he has given to us the same things. As I've just mentioned, he's given us his Holy Spirit so that we might have this kind of courage. Joshua couldn't find the strength in himself, and neither can we. And so the Lord provides what we need, again, that's what the gospel is all about. Jesus comes into this world in order to provide all that we need as his people to do his will. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Now John Bunyan reminded us that there's only one way that we can be courageous, and that's by doing what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 9 that the Apostle Paul was doing, and that is by being engaged in the spiritual warfare, by persevering in our fight against our enemies, our flesh, the world, and the devil. We need to remember that all three of these really have just one goal and that is to resist the work that God is doing in our souls by His Holy Spirit. They want to weaken us. They want to take away our courage. And the way they do this is by drawing our minds and our hearts into the world, after the things of the world, because if they can succeed, even though we know they cannot destroy us, they can at least cripple us. Because if the world is what we really want, and if doing the will of the Lord is going to threaten what we can have of the world, we're always going to hesitate to do what our Lord calls us to do because we're going to be afraid of losing what we might gain in the world. We must be willing to let go of all of it and to give it all up in order to follow Him. And that's why we must 
fight. That's why we need to stay on the path. That's why we need to resist the enemies and the temptations to get off the path and do other things. And of course, John Newton reminded us why it is we should fight this battle, try to overcome our enemies, and grow in our courage to do the Lord's work. And it's because of what Jesus has done for us. Because He loved us. Because He was willing to fight for us. Because He was willing to overcome our enemies. He was willing to go to the cross to pay for our sins and to free us from the devil's power. Really, we were given into the power of the devil because of our guilt and sin. We would suffer forever with Satan in hell and we are in his kingdom and under his dominion he is the prince of this world we were born in his kingdom but the Lord rescued us out of there and he has saved us from his dominion and he has saved us from hell that he might bring us to heaven our Lord Jesus has fought for us and now he calls us to fight for him now today we're going to look at our next hero of the faith uh, someone who really needs no introduction, a very well-known preacher that we have looked at many times and we have benefited from on many occasions as we've read his books and some of his sermons and some excerpts from his sermons by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Now Spurgeon is going to show us why we need this courage, what our goal is, what our purpose is in serving the Lord Jesus Christ and it's simply this, that we might take his gospel to a world that is perishing. That is essentially what our Lord is calling us to do this morning through the Apostle Peter in our text. Now here is one place among many in Scripture where our Lord is calling us to a life of evangelism. To tell as many people as we can the gospel, which is the good news of what Jesus Christ has done to save all who will believe and receive him. Peter writes in verse 15 of our text, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now notice first of all that Peter calls us to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Now, to sanctify means to, to make holy or to set apart. And typically it means to set apart from common use to holy use or from the world to the Lord's exclusive use. We are called holy because we have been set apart in the Lord Jesus Christ from the world, from the things we might otherwise pursue in this world to dedicate ourselves entirely to the Lord. Now, what does it mean to sanctify Christ? as Lord in your hearts. What it, that means is that He must be Lord. He must be set apart as the Lord alone of our hearts, not the flesh, which would try to dominate our hearts, or the world, which would try to take hold of it, or the devil, who would tempt us. They are not to have control of our hearts. We are not to have, as it were, control of our hearts. Jesus must have that control. Now again, that's what spiritual warfare is all about. It is a struggle for the heart. We must overcome those enemies that seek to take over our hearts so that Jesus may reign in them. In other words, Peter is telling us that we should have within our hearts and in our minds only one purpose, and that is to obey Jesus Christ as Lord, to do whatever he calls us to do. That's what it means to sanctify Christ as Lord, to be fully yielded and submitted to Him. And notice where that submission takes place in our hearts. We need to love Him and we need to submit to Him and obey Him from the heart, which means that's what we want to do. If our heart isn't in that condition, that's why we need to get, engage in spiritual warfare is that we need to beat back the enemies. We need to overcome our flesh so that we might have that kind of heart. Now Peter points to one area in particular that is the, as it were, the evidence that we are yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ and that is that we are ready to defend our hope to everyone 
who asks us. And, and what is that hope? Well, it's not the hope that we're going to get to heaven someday if we're good enough, if, if we do enough good works, if we make ourselves good enough. Paul says, nobody is good enough. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. It's, our hope is not that we can be reconciled to God if we come to Him through the right religious organization, through the right church, because the Lord has never deposited His salvation in any institution. Salvation is only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, that is our hope. The hope we are to defend is the hope that we are saved by God's grace, received by faith alone. That is the only way we can be saved that the Lord is willing to save anyone who will come to Him through faith in His Son, Jesus, and in that way alone. Peter says we need to be ready to defend that hope. Now, how often are we to defend it? He says, be ready at all times, at all times and in all places. Whenever He gives us the opportunity to defend it, we should always be ready because we may, we'll never know really. We, we can never really know when he might bring somebody across our path who needs to hear this message. But I'll tell you what, we, people cross our path all the time and the vast majority of them need to hear this message. And how many times have we seen them cross our path and know that they needed to hear this message, but we weren't ready to share it with them and we lost those opportunities, you realize the number of those opportunities is very limited. There's only going to be so many of them in our lifetime, and we are to buy up those opportunities and make the best use of them. So we need to be ready to defend this hope. Now, how does Peter tell us that we are to defend it? Well, he tells us that we are not to do it in the way that the self-righteous Pharisees did it. Remember when they passed by people who needed to hear the gospel? Of course, they didn't know it themselves, but they thought they had it. But how did they respond to the people that pass by? They pull in their robes. This person is too unclean. I can't have anything to do with this person, so I'm going to stay away from them. I'm not going to say anything to them, and I'm just going to congregate with people like me, you know, a Pharisee, who are righteous and are pursuing God in the way that I am and despise everyone else. No, that's not the way the Lord calls us to do this, but rather in gentleness, in the gentleness of love, to reach out to our neighbors who are in danger. That, that idea is meekness, humility, understanding that we ourselves are sinners saved by the grace of God and just like one beggar tells another beggar where they can find food, we, are, we were beggars and the Lord gave us food and we can show them where they can get it as well so we are to have this kind of meekness, this humility, this gentleness and to reach out to our neighbor who is in danger of perishing Love for the Lord as well, who saved us from that very same condition. He says we are to reach out to them with gentleness and reverence, or the idea is fear. Understanding what's going to happen to them, what kind of danger they are in, and the wrath that they are going to have to face on that last day if they do not hear the gospel, if they do not respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen to them. I'm reminded that uh, as we were looking at Spurgeon, I think it was the soul winner, and I'm not sure, I think this illustration actually came up in that book, but he said this, if we knew there was a man in Siberia, a man, a woman, a child, or a person in Siberia who would come to faith in Christ if each one of us went individually to that person and shared the gospel with them, would we be willing to do that? Would we be willing to go to Siberia if we knew they would be saved if we went? And if we didn't go, they wouldn't be saved. Would we go? Would we care enough about them to, to actually make that trip? Well, then Spurgeon says, but look at all the people around us that are so close. We know that the Lord intends to save. We know that he's going to save people from these individuals. Are we willing to reach out to them? Well, we, we should be willing because what's going to happen if we don't reach out to them? They're going to perish. Now, Peter tells us that we should be ready to do this. We should be ready to defend our hope whenever someone asks us to do it. And here we really need to ask ourselves the question, why would anybody ever ask us? You know, is, is Peter telling us that 
we should just basically stand around until somebody actually asks us the question, are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? How is it that I can be saved? I think any of us would answer that question if, if that should happen. But I don't think that that's what Peter has in mind here. I think what he is assuming here is that the people to whom he's writing are taking seriously what he has already told them they need to do and what they know Jesus has told his church to do. He's assuming that they are already sharing the gospel wherever they go. And that, I think, is a, is a legitimate assumption, isn't it? Because that is what our Lord clearly commands us to do. And if we, if we love Him, that's something that we should be taking seriously, even though we understand that there are obstacles. So I think He's assuming that, that they would be doing this, assuming that we would be doing this, calling us what, uh, or doing what we were called to do. But when we share it with others... I think what he's saying is this, that they will naturally have questions for us. One question being, can you defend what you're saying? Can you prove that what you're saying is true? Can you give me something more than that this is something you've simply chosen to believe? I think Peter is simply telling us that we need to be ready to defend the gospel as well as share the gospel. We need to be ready to answer their question. Now, I realize having said that, probably what's going through your mind is apologetics and arguments for God's existence and all these differing comparative religions. I mean, how do I ever get hold of all of that? How can I ever master all of that and then bring the gospel to bear on that person's life? I mean, how can I do that? Well, you know what? I don't think the Lord actually expects us to do that? How can we defend our hope? How can we answer their question? Well, I think to do that, all we really need to do is understand why it is we believe. It's our hope. Defend your hope. Why do you hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you have reasons already, don't you? Just simply share those reasons. I think that's all that Peter is really commanding us to do here, or calling us to do. Because think about it. What did Paul do to prove the gospel or to defend his hope when he stood before Felix or when he stood before Festus and King Agrippa? You know, he didn't make these, uh, these appeals to natural revelation. He didn't go into a series of apologetics. But what he did was he simply shared his testimony. I was on my way to Damascus and I was knocked off my horse and the Lord spoke to me. He told me to go here. He saved me and then he called me to preach the gospel. And so here I am preaching the gospel and you need to believe it. He, he just simply shared his reasons for his hope. And I think that's all the Lord is calling us to do. Give your testimony and then tell them the gospel. Now, is there anything else that Peter here tells us that we should be ready to do besides to being ready to defend our hope? Well, yeah, there is at least one other thing. He says we should also be ready to suffer for that hope. Remember, the people that Jesus is sending us to are not his friends. We are his friends, but they are his enemies. And they are not going to like what we have to say. They don't think they need to be saved. They think they're fine. They're all right on their own. God's going to let them into heaven as they are. That's what they believe. Their good works are going to outweigh their, their bad works. But we need to tell them that He's not going to let them into heaven. Their good works are not good enough. We need to tell them what Paul said to the Romans in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need to tell them that there are eternal consequences for their sins and that they're going to have to receive these consequences or face up to it on the day of judgment unless they turn from their sins and trust in Jesus. Maybe we have to tell them their religion isn't good enough. We need to tell them they are not good enough and again, they're not going to want to hear that. Now, when we tell them these things, the likelihood that they're going to push back and that we're going to have to suffer in some, to some degree is very high. So how can we be ready for this? Well, Peter writes in verse 14, 
But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. I think the first step to being ready to suffer is knowing that it's going to happen so that we're not caught off guard. And I, I don't think any of us are under the illusion that we're not going to suffer if we share the gospel. I think it's probably one of the main things that keeps us from actually doing it. So we have to be ready. We have to know it's going to happen. Secondly, is not being afraid of the possibility of suffering. Uh, this is obviously key. Peter says, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. We do need to remember again that nothing good has ever come from fear, at least the fear of man. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, but the fear of man is a snare, it's a trap. We need to avoid it. Fear paralyzes us. It keeps us from doing what we know our Lord clearly calls us to do. But remember what's going to happen if we do not share the truth with them. We might spare ourselves a little bit of suffering. You know, we might avoid the, the discomfort of somebody getting upset, maybe yelling in our face. Uh, but we need to remember what's going to happen to them. If we don't tell them, they may very well suffer forever. We're going to leave them in that position where they're still on the road to destruction. That's where we find them. And unless we can get them off that road and onto the road that leads to life, that's where they're going to continue to head. If nobody stops them, they're going to end up in hell. We do need to remember that our Lord has called us to reach them as well. He tells us that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked for that person to make it to the end of the road and to enter into hell. He wants them to turn from their sins. He wants them, he commands them to be reconciled to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously having his spirit living in our hearts, we want exactly the same thing. That love within us should compel us to do exactly what our Lord actually has in his own heart to do towards them, which is to reach out to them. Now again, there is the possibility of suffering if we do reach out to them. But let's not forget also what the Apostle Peter says, that if we should suffer, we are blessed. Peter writes in verse 14, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Blessed, And then he later writes in the same letter in chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. By the way, the whole letter of, of 1 Peter is about suffering. And it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who suffered in order to bring us to heaven and that we ought to follow in his steps. But he writes later in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now I want you to notice there's two things, two reasons why you're blessed here because if you suffer for Jesus in this world, when he appears, you are going to be able to rejoice, he says here, with exultation in his presence because you suffered for him. But he also says this, that if in this world you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So in other words, if you appear so obnoxious to someone that they're going to attack you, as it were, I mean, not that you are obnoxious, but if that's how you appear to them, that they're going to attack you because you're bringing Christ to them, that's the proof that the spirit of God actually rests upon you. You are so much like Jesus, they hate you and they want to attack you. You're blessed. That is a great blessing. Now again, let me remind you that our Lord does His greatest works. He has always done His greatest works through the sufferings of His people. Think about our Lord Jesus Christ and what He accomplished. Did He accomplish all of that without suffering? No, He suffered and endured more than anyone in order to bring many sons to glory. What about Paul? Did Paul suffer in his life? 
And what about the apostles? What kind of a life did they have? As we've been going through the Reformation series and we've been looking at these different individuals, John Knox, John Bunyan, John Newton, tonight Spurgeon, next week Eric Little, if you know anything about their lives at all, did any of them suffer for what they believed? And did the Lord bring anything through their suffering? I think it, it would be, if, well, if we would be useful to the Lord, we have to be willing to suffer because I think if we actually look back, we'll probably find that every worthwhile thing that the Lord has ever brought about, He has always brought about through the suffering of one of His servants. We must be willing to suffer. We must be willing to endure what the Lord calls us to endure, realizing that if we do, the Lord will greatly honor us. He will bless us in this life in the, in the knowledge that, that we are like Him and we are suffering this place. Remember how Paul says, from now on, he goes, let no one criticize me. I bear in my body the brand marks of Christ. He was saying, I am scarred, I am wounded, I have suffered. I mean, 2 Corinthians, he has a huge, huge catalog of things he endured for our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he looked at how it mutilated his body, he says, these are the brand marks of Christ and I glory in these things because I have been counted worthy to suffer in his place. Suffering is how the Lord brings about his will. Now, Peter doesn't want us to forget as well just one last thing here before we, we round this off. And that is the only suffering that counts is the suffering that we don't deserve. You know, if we do what's wrong and we suffer for it, well, we're just getting what we deserve. But if we do what's right and we suffer for it, well, then that is honoring to him. He says in verses 16 and 17, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, and they will slander you if you are a follower of Christ, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame, if not in this life, in the world to come. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Just because you're suffering doesn't mean you're, you've done anything wrong. Make sure when you suffer, it's always for doing what's right. If you do what's right, you will suffer. But don't let it be for doing what's wrong because then you just you simply deserve to suffer. Suffer, be willing to suffer for doing what the Lord calls you to do. Now finally, where are we going to find the strength to be able to do what we're called to do in this passage? To share the gospel with other people, knowing that we're going to suffer for it. To defend our hope when people ask us, you know, to defend what it is we've just said, to defend the gospel, to defend the idea that You've been, that you've been saved from hell, that I'm actually in this danger and I'm on my way to hell and that I can be saved if I just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. How are we going to do that? Not methodology, but where are we going to find the strength to do that? Well, we're not going to find it in ourselves except for what we see of Christ in us. We're only going to find it in Christ, in His Holy Spirit. We do need to remember that whatever our Lord calls us to do, He never expects us to do it on our own, in our own power, in our own strength, because we can't. We can do nothing. Apart from Christ, Paul said, I can do nothing. But through Him, I can do all things. Our Lord does not expect us to do this on our own. He has made every provision for us. He went to the cross to cleanse us from our sins, to cleanse our hearts. He is done what He has done to give us His Holy Spirit, to give us the power to do what He actually calls us to do. The Spirit of God is working from within to change our heart so that our behavior will change on the outside. He has given us His Word so that we'll know how to do the work, so that we'll know how to adorn the gospel with a life that actually matches what we're preaching so that we don't appear to be hypocritical. He has given us promises so that we may ask Him in faith and receive His help. And He has also told us, as He did with Joshua, remember how Joshua is, he's thinking about going into the Promised Land and all those battles ahead of him. How am I going to win these, these battles? That's why the Lord had to encourage him. But he meets a man with a drawn sword, and he understands that that is 
the captain of the armies of the Lord, which is our Lord Jesus, and he's going to be with him, and he's going to help him. But that's exactly what Jesus said he would do for us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He will be with us to grant us success. If we don't know that, it's only because we haven't experienced it, we haven't seen it, because we haven't been engaged in it. But every time you share the gospel with someone, the Lord is there powerfully. You can, you can almost feel His presence all around you and working. You can see it working in the heart of the people that you minister to. Now, the work is always going to seem daunting if we look at our own resources, but not if we look at His. So let's make sure that we are looking to Him often. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was once asked what the secret was to his ministry, and I'm sure it's no secret to you at this point. But when he was asked, he didn't point to his calling. He didn't point to his ability to communicate. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in the documentary this evening that um, he was often criticized for his accent. Uh, he didn't point to his photographic memory or to his devotion, his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather he pointed to those things that were actually brought about the, as it were, the power that empowered those gifts that the Lord had given to him. He pointed to those who continually looked to Jesus on his behalf in prayer. Now that's what we need to be doing if we want to experience this power, if we want to have really acquire what it is that our Lord Jesus Christ has, has provided for us. I told you he made provision, but those provisions don't just sort of automatically come down. We need to be seeking the Lord for these things. Even as, as the power room in Spurgeon's ministry in the church, which were all these people that were coming there and praying continually, were praying as they prayed, God bless them. We need to be doing that same thing. We need to be doing this. We need to be praying for ourselves. We need to be praying for each other. If we're not praying and seeking the Lord for His grace and His strength every single day, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't find His power functioning anywhere in our lives. By the way, the kind of prayer that, that Spurgeon was referring to was, was not you know, half-hearted prayers, people who didn't want to be there, people that were just kind of going through sort of their rote petitions, but people who were earnestly seeking the Lord, believing that God was actually going to answer their prayers and they were going to see the answer to those prayers in the power that was exhibited in Spurgeon's ministry and in their ministry because Spurgeon wasn't the only one who evangelized. Uh, it may look like, you know, he preached and everybody just kind of flooded into the church, but there were people in the congregation who were going out and they were inviting people in, they were going out and they were sharing the gospel and they found power in their lives too from that same source, from that same power room. God blessed the ministry of that church because they were a praying people. If we don't seek the Lord in this way, we really can't expect to see that power that we would all, I think, want to see in our own individual ministries or in the ministry of this church collectively. We need to seek the Lord. We need Jesus. We need what He provides. We need His Spirit. That's what this reminds us of, and that's what this reminds us of this morning, the table, because Jesus lived. He came into this world. He became one with us. He lived and He died in order that He might provide this power for us so that we would be saved and that we would have the ability to reach others with that gospel as well. So at this particular juncture, let's, let's first of all take note of what it is we need from the Lord. We need His power. Let's remember how He gives it in answer to prayer. Uh, through, again, the different ways, through His Word, through the encouragements of preaching, but also through the table. As we you know, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, these things are meant to get us to look up. We can't just focus on the bread and, and the wine and expect to receive anything more than bread and wine. These things are meant to get us to look to heaven, to the Lord Jesus, in faith again, to be able to receive the blessing that he has for us. But again, we'll only receive it if we have faith. We have to believe 
that the Lord actually intends to bless us, that there's something He wants to give us. We have to look to Him for it and receive it in that way, which is why we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before we would come to the table. And we also, of course, have to be repenting of our sins as we come to the table, as the warning in 1 Corinthians 11 reminds us, we don't want to eat and drink in an unworthy manner. We want to make sure that we've dealt uh, openly before the Lord, and we've, as it were, expressed our souls, we've, we've confessed all of our sins, we've repented of all of our sins, and we're renewing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the blessings of being able to come to the Lord's table every week, is that it really compels us to do this. It's something we should be doing every day, but we don't want to come to the table unless we've, we have done that. So let's take a few moments now, and let's prepare to come to the table uh, and to receive that empowerment that the Lord has for us that we might be better able to share the gospel and defend our hope before the unbelieving. Let, let's spend a few moments in prayer.